Hi, I'm Jeff Payne and I'm part of the communications team here at Behaviour Works Australia. We're a research institute, part of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute, looking at behaviour change. Pocket Change is a series of short videos we produce one each month, looking at the work of our researchers and their research and how they can change the world for the better. Hi everyone, welcome back, it's 2024 and my first Pocket Change guest this year is Peter Bragg. Peter Bragg, welcome. Thank you Great. for having me. Great to have you here. Okay. Your, In this wonderful library. Your special power, so to speak, yes. is evidence reviews. Yes. So tell me about evidence reviews and the importance of get, gathering evidence and doing research for behavioural science. Okay. So. We live at a university, mm -hmm. and there are hundreds of universities around the world, and they all do research to answer really important questions on things like climate change, uh, sustainability, uh, health and medical topics. So there's a lot of activity going on around the world, and there's huge libraries of research that have already answered a lot of the questions that we are facing. Right. What happens with that research is it tends to sit on the shelf and it isn't really put to work. Mm -hmm. So my job is to get it off the shelf, turn it into a summary and hand it to someone so that they make a slightly better decision. So when you talk about a shelf in a library, you're actually talking about the internet. As a virtual shelf. Yes. yes. So the internet, as everybody... Is it true it's got five billion pages? Five plus billion pages. Uh, there's a little counter somewhere in the world okay. that says how many pages there are on the internet. Right. And there's a lot. And then if you have a look at um, research as a subset of yeah. those pages, it's yeah. a very, very, very small subset. So there's probably about 60 or 70 million research studies in the world that are sitting on a virtual shelf somewhere. Right. Right. So that's a very small percentage of five point something billion. And then there's an even smaller percentage of studies that have brought together what those studies have found into things that we call research reviews. Right. And I kind of write them. Okay. Give us an example of a brief where okay. you have to find the evidence and find it quickly. Okay, so like all issues that are faced by governments and decision makers and leaders, it starts with some sort of problem that has to be solved. So the first step in our process is to sit down and talk with them and work out exactly what knowledge you need to solve this problem. So to give you an example, we got approached by the Victorian Health Promotion Foundation who said, we'd really like to know what works uh, for governments to promote healthy populations, to improve public health. Right. Now, as you can imagine, if you think about all the public health messages we've been exposed to, things like smoking, exercise, using sunscreen, yep. and then you multiply that by all the governments around the world, that's a huge topic. Yep. And we had about six weeks to okay. do that. So uh, we said, look, we obviously can't tackle this in six weeks. It's probably about 10 PhDs worth of work. Okay. Why don't we find five examples from around the world and we'll have a very quick look at the big research studies around those examples and then we'll talk to one person who's been involved with them. Why is there so much pressure to get evidence quickly now? Because people have to make decisions quickly. So, for example, most people who do a PhD, the first eight to 12 months of their PhD is usually doing a review of right. the topic to work okay. out what's the knowledge gap, right? Then you think about governments, uh, for example, um, the federal government, they have a three year term, right? And they like to get a lot of stuff done. Mm -hmm. And mostly they have to get things done in a fairly quick way, or at least when they're making decisions, they have to make them fairly quickly. The reality is most people who do my sort of work get Weeks, not months. Okay. And sometimes it might even be one or two weeks. Right. So we have to be really targeted in the question that we address, which is why we sit down with them and say, okay, what, what is it exactly the problem that you want to solve? Right. Because that, that, if you then think about 5 billion pages on the internet, that narrows the funnel quite a bit if you know exactly what you're looking for. So in the Vic Health example, what were yep. the five sort of findings that you found or the, or the, the Okay, so the findings? first thing was, um, the five examples were really interesting. There was one about um, food labelling laws in, in Chile. Mm -hmm. There was one about uh, the so-called sugar ban or the, uh, the 
healthy food initiatives in New York, which was actually around reducing trans fats, but also reducing sugar um, in takeaway foods. Mm -hmm. And then there was another really interesting one in South Africa where during COVID, they completely banned alcohol sales. And then there was a road safety initiative in Sweden called Vision Zero, which has been very successful, right. which is about changing the environment of the road system through things like barriers and speed humps uh, to reduce the chance of injury. Okay. So we had good examples covering, you know, big issues of our time, um, you know, alcohol consumption, healthy diet, yep. um, safety on the roads. Right. So give us an example of unintended consequences with something like an alcohol ban. That seems like a pretty good idea because we know that excessive consumption of alcohol uh, relates to uh, things like violence mm -hmm. and has health effects. Yeah. But there were some unintended consequences in terms of banning alcohol outright during okay. COVID. So yes, lots, of, lots less people went to the emergency department being involved in uh, you know, drink driving and fighting. Yeah. Uh, but there was also a big hit to the economy, right? right? Because obviously everyone who sold alcohol was effectively out of business sure. for that time. Yeah. Uh, and then there were people who were alcohol dependent yeah. who obviously were going through a significant alcohol withdrawal. Right. Because they, and that's not necessarily the best way uh, to sort of reduce your alcohol consumption. It's better okay. to go gradual. So had some great effects had some unintended consequences. And then when COVID finished, um, you know, they kind of went back to business as usual. Give us an example of a success story, a behavior change success story. So let's think about removing trans fats in takeaway food. Right. So trans fats, as many people would know, are kind of like the bad fats. And there are alternatives to using trans fats that have much less impact on things like heart health. Right. So. What they did was they essentially worked with the takeaway food industry and the, and the food industry to replace trans fats with other um, agents right. that had the same effect. Yeah. And the beauty of something like that is it's pretty invisible to consumers because they're still buying a packet of fries or whatever. Yeah. They don't know. Mm. You can't really taste the difference. Right. So highly successful and they had evidence that it reduced the amount of people who were going to emergency department with heart, heart attacks. Okay. Invisible change, mm -hmm. uh, good communication between government and industry, yeah. and then a, a really solid measure of success in terms of the, the public health impact. So that was a real success story. In your job, in your role here at Behaviour Works Australia, yes. are you seeing a speeding up of the pressure to come up with evidence? We've always known that governments want answers very, very quickly. And now we have techniques that allow us to respond to that need without compromising um, the rigour that we have associated with longer reviews. What is to stop a politician or a leader basically switching on the computer and saying, hey, internet, how do I fix world hunger? So uh, you raise a very important question about the role of artificial intelligence in particular, because I remember way back when I started teaching how to review evidence, I used to say to the students, you know, you can't just type in the question and get the answer because right. in those days you actually couldn't. You had to come up with very special terms and go to specific databases. Now we can type in a question and get an answer. Yeah. If you were to type in something about how to end world hunger, for example, you would come up with some information about ways that you could do that, but it won't be tailored to your particular setting. So let's right. say, for example, we need to provide microfinance and invest very heavily in agriculture. What if you're in a country that doesn't have a very good environment for agriculture? Or what if you don't have the capacity to um, put together a microfinance program? So the first thing about those kind of global answers is they're generally not tailored to where you are in the world and what you particularly want to do. Right. And so if you have a better understanding of what the question is that you're trying to answer, you might look for things that, uh, for example, how do we solve world hunger in resource poor settings that have economies of a particular size? So then you're getting a more targeted question and a more targeted answer. You're still using artificial intelligence to sift through large amounts of information, mm -hmm. but they're coming back with an answer that's more likely to be relevant 
So even with advances in AI, in terms of search engines and search terms, a human has to pass that information to see if it's relevant. Correct. Yeah. And then the other thing that is a little bit of a risk with artificial intelligence is how do they make judgments about the quality of the research? Right. So in traditional evidence reviewing or even in rapid reviewing, a human usually reads a study and make some judgments about things like the strength of the study design or whether there were enough people in that study or whether there might have been some bias in the way that they were recruited. Mm -hmm. Ideally, someone somewhere has read that article and applied a tool that actually goes into a bit more depth about the quality of the research. Okay. Peter Bragg, thanks very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to know more about our research projects and the courses we do, you can visit the website at behaviorworksaustralia.org.